both of them, very large supercompute clusters, um, and they are kind of independent of one another. And this is one of the things that I think has a lot of people frustrated in the Tesla community um, is that they think that, well, those resources should have been secured for Tesla instead of for XAI. So this is uh, big news yesterday. XAI announced that they are doing a Series B funding round. They closed $6 billion. Um, Elon, you know, kind of teased a little bit that there'll be more to announce in the coming weeks. Is he referring to XAI? Is he referring to partnership with Tesla? There is, there has been some conversation by Elon in the past saying that Tesla may have a, you know, ownership of XAI. That would have been interesting if they had already done that as part of this funding round. Um, the pre-money valuation was $18 billion. So plus the six were $24 billion already for a company he just formed a year ago. It's crazy. But this is the main topic I want to get right to right away. So Bill Lee, a very famous venture capitalist, entrepreneur, he's a big investor in Tesla and Musk companies. And he tweeted out this, robot brain. And Elon liked it, robot brain. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what are the ways that Tesla and XAI could work together. There are really two different areas of research when it comes to artificial intelligence right now in the world of Elon. He's got Tesla and they are doing a lot of research on how do we apply artificial intelligence to real world problems through two different means. One of those is gonna be the car. So they're trying to solve self-driving. Um, that is real world artificial intelligence. The other one is through Optimus. The Optimus bots are going to be vessels for artificial intelligence to accomplish real world tasks and um, in most instances to do work. But the there's a challenge, you know, if you just want them to do tasks, the question is how generally intelligent do they need to be? You could just have different task, uh, narrow, you know, artificial, it's called ANI, artificial narrow intelligence, that is the ability of that robot to do whatever that task is. And then if they need to do a new task, well, then they just download a new task app from the app store and they redeploy and do that separate thing. Um, so we don't really know what the application of artificial intelligence in Optimus is going to look like fully fleshed out into the future, especially to begin with. You know, the, the compute that Optimus will have on board is powerful on the one hand, but also limited when you think about it on the other hand. It's not a fully, you know, it's not the type of compute that we're using to run a lot of artificial intelligence workloads, which are gonna be in the cloud. And that's why, you know, they don't run on your laptop, they don't run on your phone. You know, your device when you're interacting with ChatGPT is going and making requests that those requests are then being processed by a large computer that's a long ways away from you. And then the results of that are being returned to you. What the Optimus robot is doing on its own is going to be limited compared with being able to do that cloud interface unless you have a, a large cloud that you can connect them to that is close enough in time, whether that's close, you know, physically or not. All of that to say that there's constraints on how you develop artificial intelligence and how you actually put it into use in the real world. And the field of artificial intelligence is so big that you really have two different things that you're focused on. One is general intelligence. And I would say that that is the world that OpenAI and DeepMind are working towards. It's just research that's on the frontier of how smart can we make artificial intelligence. And it's mostly disconnected from having it operate in the real world. It's mostly just processing language or processing video or operating in purely digital realms. And then there is some work right now that is going on by, you know, companies like NVIDIA or OpenAI. Um, and then Google has some initiatives in their own things. They're trying to figure out, okay, now let's take this frontier digital artificial intelligence that we've developed and let's figure it out 
how do we make that actually operate inside of robotics? And then, you know, Tesla is kind of coming at things from the other end where they're like, okay, these are the computers that we have, hardware three in the cars or hardware four in the cars moving forward, have hardware four, and then eventually they'll be on hardware five. Like what's the smartest thing that we can put in these hardware packages that can run not necessarily attached to the cloud? Um, and how do we get them to solve these tasks like driving or like factory work without having to tap into this general intelligence? Um, and those are, they're really two kind of different challenges. There are different ways to solve the problem and they both have their pros and their cons. Um, and it, so it looks like Elon is obviously interested in having his hat in the ring in both places. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. But then the argument is that, well, Tesla does FSD. FSD is under Tesla's, you know, purview. And this is basically taking Tesla's FSD and applying it real world, understanding the world, making decisions, neural nets, planning it. How do you see that they're actually different? So if you think back, like, why is Apple one of the most valuable companies in the world? Well, part of it is that they create this platform that then lots of other industries can take part of. And then mm -hmm. if you add up all those different things that Apple makes possible, that's actually a much larger market overall than just Apple and the smartphone market. So you've got things like Uber and Airbnb and many other software 2.0 companies that all of their value, all of their market cap is actually built on top of, but surpasses Apple. Like if you, if you add up all those other things, it's much, much, much bigger than the valuation of Apple. And that much, much bigger thing is the thing yeah. that Apple or that Tesla is pursuing directly by having the Optimus robot. If you think of artificial intelligence in the real world, they are, they're going after the applications of artificial intelligence in the real world, not necessarily trying to create a platform. That's NVIDIA is more trying to create the platform that other people, and not only by creating the hardware and the GPUs that they make, but also they have all sorts of research tools and um, ways that they're trying to help robotic startups do training on their robots. And so they're really trying to pursue that um, base AI platform opportunity that would be analogous to the Apple iPhone opportunity for the age of artificial intelligence. And Elon and Tesla are really trying to aim straight at the, let's, let's figure out how to go and make the Ubers and the Airbnbs and all of these other huge applications um, without necessarily trying to be a platform for other people to solve those problems on their own. And the, I think the opportunity is larger for Tesla if they can do that correctly than the opportunity that NVIDIA is trying to pursue at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And it, like you said earlier, they're actually very different, right? One is uh, real world vision, understanding the environment, but then the other one is large language model. You need both and both need to come in. How do you talk to the bot? What do they say back? Those kind of things, very different. Um, I can see, so both companies are creating supercomputers Let's share that information and then come back to this conversation. So with XAI, the announcement was that they're going to build a supercomputer. They're going to call it the Gigafactory of Compute. And this is why they're raising that money. So the plan is to build a supercomputer with 100,000 specialized GPUs, which would be at least four times larger than the biggest AI cluster today. I think Elon has said that uh, very soon they're going to be surpassing the even OpenAI's GPT-4, the massive gigafactory of compute could help the young startup catch up to older, better funded rivals. OpenAI, Microsoft uh, would require billions of spending and significant power access. He, has, he hopes to have it running by the fall of 2025. So that's still next year. 
And then we've already previously announced that they could partner with Oracle. It's going to have the largest H100 chip customer. Um, they would accelerate XAI's Grok A1 Assistant with fewer speech restrictions. But this will require a location that's remote and have a lot of power. So this is the big rush. Everybody's trying to create the largest GPU clusters so that you can have the strongest, most powerful AI. But Tesla themselves has their own plans for a supercomputer. We know that they're creating one in um, Buffalo, New York. This is Sawyer saying he, there's somebody who shared a photo, a flyover, and they showed this part. Love all the glass design at the end. Here's, here's the Gigafactory Texas. Elon replied saying the rear portion of the factory extension, the part furthest away from the glass, will be a super dense, water-cooled supercomputer cluster. So even Tesla is going to be creating a supercomputer cluster as well. Thoughts on the fact that both companies are creating supercomputers. Yeah, and, and of roughly the same size. I mean, we don't know what the plan for Tesla's supercompute cluster, for what the size of that is going to be next year. The stated goal for this year is that we'll reach, you know, roughly 85,000 H100 equivalents, I believe, by the end of 2024. Um, so then by fall of 2025, we could be significantly larger than that. But just knowing that they're planning to have 100,000 H100 equivalents in the fall of 25 for XAI, I mean, that is the same, that's bigger than what Tesla is uh, planning just for this year. So very large, you know, you can just say both of them, very large supercompute clusters, um, and they are kind of independent of one another. And this is one of the things that I think has a lot of people frustrated in the Tesla community. Um, is that they think that, well, those resources should have been secured for Tesla instead of for XAI. And the question right now is, you know, I, I don't know that that's a fair assessment because Elon has said that we're currently not compute constrained. There are other bottlenecks that we have that we have to figure out how to solve. Mm, currently, that definitely. is the validation bottleneck. And so if we had secured all of these compute resources for Tesla, but compute's not the bottleneck. Well, that doesn't seem like the most efficient use of shareholder funds and re the resources of Tesla overall um, to solve these AI problems. The other thing that I think we need to just keep in our minds is that frontier AI model research has always been something that is separate in Elon's mind from developing real world AI at Tesla. And you don't have to go any further than the fact that he started OpenAI or funded um, mm -hmm. and helped to found OpenAI outside of Tesla originally. The goal of doing that was to create a check and a balance against DeepMind and Google's capabilities in frontier AI research. And so that's why Elon started that originally. And, he, and that was not started inside of Tesla. And there were very practical reasons why it was not started in Tesla. One of them was the same thing that he has cited when he started XAI, that it's just hard to get the people who are capable of doing that research to come inside of your big company to do that specific type of research. Getting people to develop, like you can't go to any research field I mean, like you go to Waymo, there, there's a couple of startups, you go to Cruise, there, but there are a very limited number of options for people who actually want to develop autonomous driving. Um, and Tesla does not have any issues competing for talent when that talent is focused on solving the autonomous driving problem. And they're not going to have that problem for people that want to develop the applied AI in Optimus robots either. But Though that set of people is a different set of people from the Andre Karpathy's of the world when Andre decides he's done with FSD and he wants to go back and tinker with Frontier AI again. And that's why he went back to OpenAI. He, he started at OpenAI, then he came to Tesla, then he went back to OpenAI because the types of problems that OpenAI is trying, trying to solve are just different problems than Tesla is trying to solve. There is some shared application that maybe down the road can they can work out a partnership between 
XAI and Tesla, or, you know, right now OpenAI is trying to figure out how their LLMs can be integrated into these robots, but they're not running the robots end to end. There's still a whole lot of other software that has to be developed that OpenAI is not doing that has to be figured out in order to get those things to work properly as well. Um, and so that's why, you know, he had to start OpenAI to begin with. And then once OpenAI became captured and he was no longer involved in it, and now it became the Microsoft version of Google and DeepMind, well, he felt like there's no proper check and balance that he has influence over on those. And so, you know, people just need to remember that XAI's ambitions are much more to continue to be a check and balance on centralized um, major players in frontier AI development 